Earthbound is not just one of the greatest RPGs of all time. And Earthbound is not just one of the greatest games in the Super Nintendo. Earthbound is quite simply one of the greatest games ever made. If you take pride in calling yourself an RPG gamer or a retro gamer and you are not familiar with Earthbound, you should be simply ashamed of yourself. There is more heart, ingenuity, and creativity in this one title than there are in most series. The words criminally underrated do not even begin to properly describe the reception of Earthbound. It is undeniably one of Nintendo's greatest gaming achievements, and outside of Japan, it continues to be ignored. To play Earthbound is to love Earthbound, and to the people who love this game, it continues to boggle the mind that it is not more well known outside of Japan. That is because not only is it among the greatest role-playing and Super Nintendo games, it is among the greatest games of all time. Earthbound stars Ness. Yes, that Ness from Smash Brothers, but more on that later. And that's all I really want to say right now, because you're either in one of two camps. One, you're already familiar with Earthbound and just curious to see what I have to say about it, or two, you know next to nothing about this game. So explaining the story and all of that would either be a waste of time or ruin the surprise. I wanted this video to be as spoiler free as possible and I wanted the people that have never played this game to experience as much as they possibly can on their own. So with that in mind, I'm going to skip all that and just jump right to the review. But even that's going to be tricky. There is so much to talk about here. There are countless reasons why Earthbound is an incredible game. But I feel its greatest strength lies in its comparison to other RPGs. By breaking the tradition of a typical RPG, Earthbound truly stands as a classic. So with this in mind, here are five reasons why Earthbound is better than almost every RPG ever made. Number one, a modern setting. When you think of RPGs, what do you think of? Knights, swords, mages, spells, dragons, demons, goblins, and so on, right? Well, Earthbound has none of these. Well, almost. But unlike most RPGs, Earthbound doesn't take place in medieval times, or the distant future for that matter. It takes place in the present, or the 90s specifically, I guess. It still plays like your average RPG, with random battles, equipment to buy, spells to learn, and so on. But Earthbound puts a modern twist on all these common RPG conventions. You're not battling imps and slimes, you're battling spiteful crows, unassuming local guys, annoying old party men, moles playing rough, worthless protoplasm, handsome toms, zombie dogs, and a giant puke monster. <coughs> and it doesn't stop there. You get poisoned, but more often you catch the nighttime sniffles. And when a character dies, where else will they go but the hospital? Enemies don't drop money, your dad keeps track of that and deposits the cash you've earned in your bank account, which of course you access with your ATM card. Weapons are not swords and staffs, they're baseball bats and frying pans. Hell, Ness gets homesick when you don't call home often enough. It all creates a refreshing change of pace and an otherwise trite characteristic of the genre, making the setting of Earthbound not only unique, but also a parody of a typical RPG. And you know me, I love a good parody. Number two, our heroes are kids. Ness is one of the most unlikely leads for an RPG, and is therefore among the most awesome. You see, Ness isn't some introverted, tortured soul battling his inner demons. He's a little kid in a striped shirt, shorts, and a shifting baseball cap. He's also not some punk who on his 16th birthday must fulfill his family birthright and purge the land of corrupt kings and evil tyrants. He's just a natural born savior. And he doesn't use the mythical blade passed down throughout the ages to battle darkness and the ever prolific forces of evil! He's a kid who goes around and beats the shit out of things with his baseball bat. That's fucking rad. Number three, random battles and level grinding. Another thing that Earthbound gets right is fixing the common problem of too many random battles in an RPG. Remember when you had to backtrack to some place towards the beginning of a game and you kept running into creatures so weak and worth so little experience and money that it was a complete waste of your time to actually fight them? Well, in Earthbound there's this awesome thing where when your levels get high enough, you... You know what? Just watch. <laughs> Alright, you see what just happened there? See, my kids have grown so strong that there is a 100% probability that they'll win the fight in the first round. The game recognizes this so I can skip the battle altogether and just get the experience. And this doesn't just go for super weak enemies, sometimes they'll get the drop on a strong enemy and get a free battle. 
Now, I'm no RPG aficionado, but I've only seen this in Earthbound and in Persona 4. This cuts level grinding times way down because you seldom get into battles with enemies that are below your level. I can't say there isn't any level grinding, but for a 30 plus hour quest, I'd say there's far less than what you'd expect from an RPG of this era. Number 4. Well-written NPC Dialogue For RPGs, one of the most important rules of thumb is whenever you get to a new town, you talk to everyone, at least twice. But what do you usually end up hearing? The same old blah 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 exposition, which can really bring the flow of your adventure to a grinding halt. But the NPC dialogue in Earthbound is so well written, you'll want to hunt down every last citizen of every last town just to hear what kind of crazy crap they're going to say. Yes, even the dialogue from the dozens of nameless townspeople is awesome. Now, I've read a lot of reviews about this game, and some critics on its enthusiasts and others, but there seems to be one thing that nearly everybody can agree upon. Earthbound has some of the wittiest, smartest, and downright funniest dialogue. Not to mention one of the greatest translations ever. So you still gotta talk to everyone, but at least they'll have something interesting to say. Like this guy. This guy's awesome. And finally, number five. A memorable story that doesn't take itself very seriously. Earthbound is a very fun game to play, and this is because the story takes a backseat to the gameplay. Now, don't get me wrong, often the story is the best part of an RPG, but I couldn't even begin to tell you how many RPGs I play where I didn't give two shits about the plot. Modern RPGs especially have become too pretentious with ridiculously complex or long-winded stories. It's still important to have a story, and an established drive for our heroes to push the game along. But we don't need a 15 minute barrage of exposition every 20 damn minutes of gameplay. Especially when the story only really amounts to, Hey kid, you're the hero! Go save the world! Many RPGs try to have huge epic tales, and in my opinion, few succeed. Earthbound succeeds because it doesn't try too hard. I'd say Earthbound mostly resembles Dragon Quest VIII and Final Fantasy V, in that it's just fun to play. It's a very silly game that only takes itself seriously when it needs to. But that isn't to say that there aren't a number of memorable moments, characters, and boss fights, because trust me, there are. But I mean, one of your characters' default names is Pooh. Pooh! But if you're like me, you'll change that stupid name to something a lot better. But I don't mean to undersell Earthbound's story. There's still a classic and persistent villain who will drive you nuts, and a few key moments that are the very definition of epic and profound. The biggest compliment of Earthbound's story is while extremely memorable, it never overstays its welcome. Never getting in the way of the most important part of any game, of any genre. The gameplay. While it's certainly nothing unique to the genre, one must mention the amazing soundtrack. I would never make the claim, however, that Earthbound has the greatest soundtrack on the Super Nintendo because, let's face it, a statement like that would require a very long discussion and might end with a fistfight. But I will make the claim that Earthbound has the most diverse soundtrack on the Super Nintendo. In fact, anyone who claims that video games are not a legitimate format of music needs to sit down with this eclectic soundtrack. With over 100 songs, Earthbound's soundtrack stands as a crash course for intro music theory. Blues, jazz, reggae, electronic, hip-hop, even metal. <laughs> yeah, some pretty brutal 16-bit double bass kicks. Love it. From super wacky songs to super serious songs, the musical range displayed is staggering. Sound plays an enormous role in the experience of Earthbound. So much so that throughout your journey, you're collecting sound stones that come together to make one grand piece of music, a la Link's Awakening for the Game Boy. Composers Keiichi Suzuki and Hirokazu Tanaka were clearly given a huge sandbox to play in. Just like everything else in Earthbound, the soundtrack is unique, memorable, and genius. No fooling, I could go on for hours about all the neat things in this game. Like you can actually play it one-handed. Then of course all the philosophical and religious undertones of the characters in their journey. But I think you get the idea. Now it's time to talk about something else. A lot of you out there only know Earthbound as that one game Ness from Smash Brothers is in, but whoa buddy, get comfortable, there's a lot more to talk about. Earthbound as we Americans know it is actually the second game in the Mother series, as it is known in its native Japan. Just like Secret of Mana, it's actually Seiken Densetsu 2. The difference here is we actually got Seiken Densetsu 1 in the forms of Final Fantasy Adventure and Sword of Mana. But we never got Mother 1, or Mother 3 for that matter. We just got Mother 2, aka Earthbound. 
The Mother series is the brainchild of Shigesato Itoi, who is something of a renaissance man and a cultural icon in Japan. While outside of the East, he's mainly known for creating the Mother series. In his native land, he's a well-known essayist, writing on his personal website the Hobo Nikai Itoi Shimbun, or the Almost Daily Itoi News. As the name implies, he has posted entries almost daily since 1998 and continues to do so to this very day. He has published a number of books from the material on this site. He's also the creator of a notebook slash day planner, the Hobonichi Techo. Hobonichi being the abbreviated name of his website, which is apparently extremely popular in Japan. Miyazaki fans might be pleased to know that he played the voice of the father in the Japanese version of My Neighbor Totoro. And gamers might be pleased to know that while he's often credited for naming the Game Boy and the Virtual Boy, he claims to only have given the Nintendo 64 its name. He has also appeared numerous times on Iron Chef, and in addition to crafting the Mother games, he's also produced a popular bass fishing game. It's not hard to understand why the Mother games are so idiosyncratic. In 1989, Nintendo and Mystery Toy produced Mother for the Japanese Famicom, where it was a smash hit. In 2006, readers of famed Japanese gaming magazine Weekly Famitsu rated Mother as the 9th greatest Famicom game and the 38th best game of all time. Much like Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy before it, the success of Mother in the East assured an inevitable release here in the West, where it was to be called Earthbound. However, as I'm sure you know, things didn't exactly turn out that way. Phil Sandhop, who had a hand in localizing the likes of Final Fantasy, Metroid 2 The Return of Samus, and Super Mario 64, was in charge of localizing Mother, and in an interview has confirmed that in 1990, Earthbound was 100% complete with American packaging, an 80-page manual, and two posters, with artwork on one side and dungeon maps on the other, a treatment also given to Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy. To quote Mr. Sandhop from an interview with LostLevels.org, essentially the game was already a wrap and was in line for production when details for the Super Nintendo launch started to firm up. The final, approved build of Earthbound was completed by September of 1990. He goes on to say that because of marketing problems, Earthbound was at first simply sidelined. And by the time Nintendo had gotten back to it, the Super Nintendo had become a company-wide priority, and a game like Earthbound with its posters and 80-page manual was too expensive, and with it being an RPG, also too risky to produce, and was unfortunately never released in America. Instead, in its place, we were stuck with Wario's Woods and Zelda's fucking revenge. But at least we got Kirby's adventure, right? Another thing to note was the release of Final Fantasy just a few months earlier in July. You'll remember that Final Fantasy was given a hell of a push by Nintendo Power's marketing muscle with a contest and an entire issue dedicated to the game. Despite the pushes Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy had received, neither game raked in the sales that had been seen in Japan. Sales numbers are difficult to find for this time, but it's probably fair to hypothesize that Earthbound's marketing strategy was sidelined because Final Fantasy, what with its contest and guidebook, wasn't the success Nintendo of America had hoped for. According to Mr. Sandhop, everything, including a marketing strategy for Earthbound, was ready to go in September of 1990. But then, maybe Final Fantasy's numbers from July and August came back, and Nintendo might have decided it was best to re-evaluate Earthbound's marketing approach. At least, this is my theory for Earthbound's initial delay. What we do know for sure is that while Earthbound simmered on the back burner, the Super Nintendo became a bigger and bigger priority. Sega's Genesis and Sonic the Hedgehog certainly didn't make things any less risky for Nintendo of America, and something like Earthbound for the NES was just not in the cards. And we were so close, too. As Mr. Sandhop emphasizes, Earthbound was not cancelled, it was simply not produced and manufactured. It's worth mentioning that Enix did eventually release Dragon Warriors 2, 3, and 4, each with giant posters, but it's also true that Enix America had gone under by the mid-90s. It would appear they made a few too many bad business decisions, and couldn't keep financial stability in the West. By 1990, Americans simply weren't that interested in the RPG. But the Japanese certainly were, and that's where Mother 2 comes in. In August of 94, Mother 2, Gigu no Gyakushu, or Gigas Strikes Back, was released for the Super Famicom. The game topped Famitsu's weekly top 30 after receiving a glowing score of 34 out of 40 from the magazine's notoriously brutal reviewers. Famitsu readers will go on to vote Mother 2 as the 37th greatest game of all time. 
The game remained popular in Japan in the years following and was ported to the Game Boy Advance with Part 1 in June of 2003. But across the pond, things were a little different. By the mid-90s, the RPG still hadn't really struck a nerve with North American gamers, though things were looking up. In the years since Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy floundered on the sales charts, titles like Final Fantasies 2 and 3, Secret of Mana, a handful of games on the Game Boy, and for what it's worth, Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, had brought more attention to the genre in the West. I hypothesized that the critical and commercial failure of Mystic Quest, an extremely simple, almost insultingly shallow beginner's RPG designed for North Americans, sent a shockwave back to Japan. Sure, the RPG was still a niche genre in the West, but assuming Americans' disinterest in RPGs was because we were too dense was a costly mistake. We had since proven that those who enjoy RPGs could handle the real deal, and with the N64 still a few years off, was the time finally right for Mystery Toy's quirky little game? Nintendo took a chance and released Earthbound for the Super Nintendo in the summer of 1995. And Nintendo went all out, giving Earthbound the red carpet treatment. Instead of a standard box, Earthbound came packaged in an enormous box, typically reserved for games like Super Bomberman. Instead of a standard instruction book, it came packaged with its very own strategy guide. And this guide wasn't some hastily thrown together rag. The entire thing was written as a faux traveler's guide to the world of Earthbound. It was a clever and entertaining read, even if you weren't playing through the game. All this tied with a fierce ad campaign, Earthbound was headed for America, and Nintendo was determined to make it a hit. And we all know how that went. Many blame the commercial failure of Earthbound on its ad campaign, which actually said, This game stinks! But personally, given the popularity of Captain Underpants, Goosebumps, and Ren and Stimpy at the time, this might not have been the worst promotional strategy. I think it had more to do with that expensive giant box. This was years before games like Rock Band and Wii Fit introduced the idea that spending a ton of money on a video game was commonplace. In 95, 70 bucks was asking a lot. I remember even renting Earthbound meant my parents had to put a deposit down because of the damn strategy guide. But then again, this was also a couple years before Final Fantasy VII made RPGs the North American money-making machine it is today. And after reading some of the fucking hilarious reviews this game got at the time, eh, perhaps we weren't ready for a game like Earthbound. The debate over the reason for Earthbound's financial failure will rage on, but we could all agree on one thing. It had no right to be so ignored. Even though Mother 2 was a hit in Japan, the series has a dodgy history for the next few years. For a short period after, Mother 3 was first planned for immediate release for the Super Famicom. Eventually, it was slated to be one of three launch titles for the ill-fated N64 CD add-on, the N64DD, aptly titled Earthbound 64. But Mystery Toy and his team found the 3D technology very difficult to work with, and after years of speculation, little tidbits of information, and the only real preview being this trailer from Space World 1999, Earthbound 64 was cancelled, both domestically and abroad. But unlike Banjo-Tooie, Kirby 64, and Paper Mario, Earthbound 64 was cancelled not because the CD add-on bit the dust, but because it was floundering in production. However, if you'll remember, Earthbound for the NES was not cancelled, it was just not produced, meaning that a few finished copies do in fact exist. In January 1998, one alleged prototype cartridge appeared online and was snatched up by members of Neo Demiforce, an up-and-coming translation group already working on a Mother 1 English translation. The ROM was dumped online and given the name Earthbound Zero by the group to avoid confusion. If you've played an English ROM or a reproduction cartridge of Earthbound, you've most likely been playing this prototype. In the years following, there had been speculation that this was all a hoax perpetrated by the translation group. But again, in an interview with LostLevels.org, Phil Sandhop assures that the dialogue in Earthbound Zero is his, not of Neo Demiforce. He has also confirmed that the cartridge is the real thing. Quote, open it up and my fingerprints could still be on the inside. Side. Furthermore, changes Mr. Sandhop confirms he made like the run button and an extended ending appear in the GBA remake. The authenticity of the prototype still remained a controversial topic for some, but it has been pretty well agreed upon that this and possibly as many as three other prototypes that have popped up are the American version of Earthbound that was never manufactured. 
When I originally made this video in 2009, I hadn't played more than maybe 20 minutes of Earthbound Zero. But I've since then sunken my teeth into a reproduction cartridge. People are always asking me what I think of it, and since I have no plans to review it, I'll just tell you, it sure is an NES RPG. It's similar to Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy in that it was a benchmark game for its time, but it has not aged well. It isn't as grind-happy as Dragon Warrior or Final Fantasy, so it comes recommended, but it's still too much for me to recommend to anyone except hardcore retro RPG fans. I've spoken with some friends from Fangamer, a website with affiliation to Starman.net, and they've assured me that a lot of Earthbound fans have a similar opinion of Earthbound Zero. Also, since I originally made this video, I've played another noteworthy Famicom-only RPG, Capcom's Sweet Home. Allow me to be blunt. Sweet Home is the better game by a mile. If you're thinking of buying a reproduction cart, consider Earthbound Zero, but I'd say Sweet Home is money better spent. So, by the late 90s, as the Super Nintendo faded and the N64 rose, hardcore Earthbound fans had Earthbound and Earthbound Zero to keep them satiated, but to the rest of North America and Europe, which didn't even get Mother 2, the games remained largely unknown. That is until the worldwide best-selling Super Smash Bros. games featured key characters Ness and Lucas. It's safe to assume that a large percentage of Earthbound fans were first introduced to the series through the Smash Bros. games. However, the reason these two made it into these games in the first place was because of the lasting popularity of the series in Japan. After the demise of the N64DD and Earthbound 64, Mothers 1 and 2 were re-released for the GBA in June of 2003. This was in part to officially announce and drum up hype for Mother 3, which was currently in development. The ploy worked, as weeks before its April 2006 release, Mother 3 was voted the most wanted game in Weekly Famitsu. After release, it outrated its predecessor with a score of 35 out of 40, and allegedly sold over 300,000 copies in just 5 days. Once again, the Japanese welcomed the next chapter in the legendary series with wide open embrace. But as I mentioned, and as I'm sure you already know, Mother 3 never left Japan. But this doesn't mean there wasn't a fight to bring it to the West. Thus begins the long road to sorta but not really getting Mother 3 outside of Japan. The key character to this story is the Earthbound mega fan site, Starman.net. For years, Starman.net fought to have the remaining Mother games released stateside. There were three petitions organized by the website. The first for a possible Mother 1 port to the Game Boy Color, which yielded a modest 1800 signatures, nearly twice their goal. The signatures were bound in a book and sent to Nintendo in May of 1999, which, for those of you keeping score, would be around four months after the first Smash Brothers came out in Japan and little over a month after it came out in North America. Starman.net never did hear from Nintendo, however, shortly thereafter an email slash write-in campaign was started which did yield a response from Nintendo of America's Consumer Service Department, where they acknowledged they received and read their original petition, but only confirmed that they had, quote, forwarded the package to the appropriate department for review. Neither confirming nor denying the possibility of Mother 1 for the Game Boy Color, saying, quote, only time will tell. Time, if you're just joining us here, said no. The second petition was in 2000 for Earthbound 64, this time amassing a more impressive 10,000 signatures. The signatures were once again bound into a book and sent to Nintendo in September of 2000, which was unfortunately a month after it had been announced that Earthbound 64 was cancelled. But though their timing was unfortunate, Starman had still proven a lot. At this point, the community and their efforts had gotten the attention of major websites like IGN64, and once again proven that Earthbound fans outside of Japan were dedicated to this series, all while maintaining an adult and professional demeanor. The final petition was for Mother 3, this time reaching a difficult to ignore 30,000 signatures, a number reached in a scant 11 months in February of 2003. Their efforts were recognized once again around the web, and the petition was mentioned on Penny Arcade, Nintendojo, Electronic Gaming Monthly, Slashdot, and again by IGN. The petition wrapped in April with 31,338 unique signatures. The signatures were bound and packaged with a giant 260-page anthology filled with fan art and four discs of fan music. Four copies were printed, each allegedly weighing nine pounds apiece, with one being sent to Mr. Itoi himself. 
The goal, unlike the other two petitions, was not necessarily to have Mother 3 released in America, but to prove to Nintendo how strong the Mother and Earthbound fanbase was, as evidenced by the HARD TO IGNORE printed on each petition. Starman.net never would hear directly from Nintendo, and Mother 3, of course, never saw release outside of Japan. But their hard work would get them in the pages of Nintendo Power. Nintendo of America president Reggie fils has stated publicly that he's aware of the fanbase, stating that he has been, quote, bombarded by emails from Mother fans in the US. Not the response fans wanted, but a response nonetheless. In 2008, Shack News' Aaron Lind claims to have asked a Nintendo executive at a luncheon about the petition and the accompanying fan anthology. His response was, oh yeah, I heard about that. Those guys don't know when to quit, do they? The Starman.net community deserves credit for taking the high road. Their page speaks of the Mature Link petition, which had corralled a stunning 13,000 digital signatures. Remember when everyone was all bent out of shape over the graphics in Wind Waker, and then it came out and it turned out to be amazing and it sold a couple million copies? Yeah, Starman.net had the right attitude with their petitions. But Nintendo still had no plans to bring Mother 3 outside of Japan. So the fans said fuck it and did it themselves. After nearly two years of hard work, in October of 2008, a translation patch was released for Mother 3 so English-speaking fans the world over can finally experience what everyone except the Japanese has been missing. Since then, French, German, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Malay, and Dutch versions of the patch have also been made available. Furthermore, patches exist for Mother 1 and 2 for the GBA. At this point, Nintendo was definitely aware of the actions of Starman.net, so, in keeping with their professional demeanor, ROMs for these games cannot be found on Starman.net, only the patches. And while these patches were being produced, the website stated that should Nintendo ever release any of these games, they would pull the plug on the projects immediately. But it never came to this. So if you want to finally experience Mothers 1 and 3, it's no problem. In fact, if you have the Japanese cards, it's totally legal. But then what about Mother 2, aka Earthbound? You know, the one that actually came out over here? Smash Bros. Brawl includes a masterpiece collection on the vault screen, where demos of a handful of classic Nintendo games can be played. And in the Japanese version of Brawl, Mother 2 is playable among them. However, fans were irked when a Earthbound demo was removed for the US release. This was the first indication that a virtual console release of Earthbound, or any Mother game for that matter, might not happen despite fan outcry. But those thoughts were dashed when in March of 2008, the ESRB issued a rating for Earthbound on their website. Now with the rating came no official release date as the ESRB is, small detail, not Nintendo. But many fans were ecstatic and held out hope that Earthbound would see a virtual console release. Maybe then they could prove how strong the fanbase really was. What if it was downloaded a whole bunch of times and what if it was enough to finally convince Nintendo that there is money to be made with these games? However, in February of 2009, Starman.net released a lengthy statement, first stating that Earthbound would not be coming to Virtual Console, and finally detailing why. Apparently, Earthbound did too good a job parodying a 1990s America, with many visual and audio references that are questionably legal. The article stresses that it is more the job of a lawyer to keep their client out of court than to defend them in court. But what about that ESRB rating? This, if you can believe it, was later to be revealed a mistake on the part of the ESRB. <laughs> yeah, oops. It's not the most believable excuse, but an excuse nonetheless. And you know what? About that. My original Earthbound video took a couple of months to prepare and for a time was my most ambitious video. And in that video I made a point to call out Nintendo for not releasing Earthbound on Virtual Console. The fine folks at Starman.net and Earthbound Central spoke well of my video and posted it on their sites, giving me the biggest numbers of my career up to that point. But then five days, five days after I posted my original Earthbound review, Starman.net decided that that would be a good time to release their document outlining Earthbound's copyright issues. So thanks for taking months of work and rendering it all null and void in less than a week. But why it's taken me this long to finally remake this video is my fault. All kidding aside, and you know I love you Starman.net, it's important to note, however, that there still has never been an official word from Nintendo. This statement is speculation on behalf of the fans. But to be fair, the Japanese never got a virtual console release either. 
The demo in the Japanese version of Brawl may be the last time Nintendo releases anything Mother related ever again. Shortly after Mother 3's release, Mr. Itoi stated that there were no plans for a Mother 4. Well, tell that to the fans. Earthbound's fan community continues to grow, seemingly without protest from Nintendo. Throughout this journey, the actions of the fans have had neither the blessing nor the curse of Nintendo. Are they looking the other way as a way of saying sorry? Does the lack of cease and desist orders mean Nintendo is saying, look, our hands are tied, but as long as you kids play nice, we cool? Other fan communities have certainly done less and gotten worse from other companies. Though the most frustrating thing, the aspect underpinning this entire ordeal, is that there is an audience for this game now. But at the very least, a fan community has been left alone to thrive. There is an unbelievable amount of information documented on dozens of sites about Earthbound's history, so please take this video as the cliff notes. In 2011, there are few stones left unturned. So even if you've played and enjoyed the Mother games, I encourage you to hit up your favorite search engine and spend an afternoon delving deep into the fascinating and oftentimes tragic history of Earthbound. It's fair to say that it truly is one of the most interesting and nested subjects in the history of video games. And it's a story that continues on. You never know, maybe I'll have to remake this video again in a couple years. Well, I think I said enough. I hope you all enjoy what almost turned into a short film documentary. So, thanks for watching. Fuzzy Pickles. <laughs>